with you. I'll share a little bit about my background before everybody gets in. Is that okay? So you'll know why I'm here and why I'm going to ask you to speak. My training at NYU Medical Center was in obstetrics and gynecology. And my, after doing the residency there in old GYN, my subspecialty was pelvic surgery. In 1993, I moved to Florida and joined a big practice. And as a result of a cancer that I had at the time that was uh, a melanoma and was treated right here at Moffitt, I uh, had a lot of questions that I began to ask about the way medical training was done for me and what I used to offer patients. Some of the things that I was frustrated with is I was very excited, probably as many of you are now, with the concept of the intrigue of how the body works and learning about the anatomy and the physiology and how things come together. The frustration was that despite all this knowledge that was gained, both through med school and then later on res residency and later in clinical practice, Noticing how people responded to it and the lack of really impacting on a large scale level a lot of people to truly get them treated, and I mean cured, of heart disease, of cancer, um, of the normal diseases that we see every day and basically keep seeing them in the clinics. And you haven't been doing your clinics yet, but when you do in third year, I think is when you start, is that right? You will see that sometimes it's frustrating to see these people keep coming back and then we write prescriptions for them with medications, and yet they're not getting better, completely better. The symptoms are going away. And here I was, just finishing my fellowship, and already training physicians, I used to be a clinical instructor at NYU at the time, and observing that I myself came down with a cancer. What happened? What was going on? And the surgeon that I had was a phenomenal surgeon, and when I asked him a simple question like, how can I prevent this from coming back? He didn't really have a concrete example or method of what I can do to prevent that cancer from coming back. Or to tell me even how he thought this cancer came back. He gave me the usual understanding of what we have in terms of, we think that the, these oncogenic cells are you know, proliferating because of increased vascularity, but there was nothing about my life that he could observe that could correlate with the cancer. Other than the excuse that you've been exposed to sun, but how many of us here in Florida are exposed to the sun? <laughs> and so I said, if that's the case, if that simple explanation of sun exposure is what caused the melanoma, then why isn't everybody else who's exposed to sun getting melanoma? There must be something else. So I began to question everything in my life at that point. And I, I, I highly urge all of you to begin to question every fact that you hear by every professor. The challenge for me was when I began to do that in residency, the answer I would get when I would challenge is Professor So-and-so, who's been the professor emeritus at NYU or, or at Harvard, said this is what is going on and this is the answer. So the challenge was, how do I overcome these dogmas that have been passed down, or the medical articles that were thrown at me saying, see, this is double-blind placebo-controlled study that showed 70% success rate when such and such happens. I said, well, what about the 30%? How do I know that I'm not one of those 30%? I would like to be the 30% that got cured, or that were the placebo that didn't, depending on the situation. So even when we use science to the utmost perfection and precision, we find frustrations with the fact that sometimes those double blind placebo control studies are still going to leave us with a group of people that things don't match for. Or when you look at the anatomy that you're studying now, there will be people that will not match the norm. What do we do with those individuals? And as you start to go through the studies in school, you will begin to see if you begin to question those same questions that I had, but it took me a while to get to the point where I had to literally have a cancer affect me to ask those questions, hopefully you don't have to have any kind of sufferings in your life to be able to start asking these same simple questions. Why? Not what's happening, but why is it happening? Did you notice that difference? So when a physician is seeing a patient in their office, the usual question is, doctor, what do I have? And the answer is, oh, let me find a diagnosis for you. 
And so what most physicians do is we go through a process of scientific examination of the problem. We go through a history and physical, and you'll get to that in your clinicals. So in the history, we try to elicit, are there any clues that tell us what's going on with the individual? In the physical exams, we look for signs, such as changes in the heart rate, changes in the blood pressure, changes in the visual appearance of the individual. And we use our modern medicine system, which is the Western system of medicine, that you're going to be learning in the next four years here, without realizing that there are other systems around the world, but for thousands of years developed other methods of observation that give many clues about what's going on with one's health, with one's body, and with one's mind. So I urge you to keep looking for the other way of thinking. Always think outside of the box. Don't accept anything as a fact. Because science is constantly evolving and changing. And if that's the case, you have to recognize that and don't be stuck in one dogma. Now, what we'll do is we're going to take a break from a moment, if it's okay with you guys, because I know most of you are probably starting. I'll let you grab some food, and then we'll continue. Okay? <laughs>